Hare Krishna Adhikar Om Pro. Yes. Nice to see you once again today. Yes. And today I was thinking that we could do a quick kind of discussion on if somebody wants to study Gaudiya Vaishnavism, what all does it entail? Hmm. You know, what does studying Gaudiya Vaishnavism, what are the fields involved in it? Is it theology? Is it philosophy? Is it history? So something like that. And maybe we could talk about from the perspective of academic disciplines. We could talk about it from the perspective of say core texts from our tradition or whatever way you would like to have it. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. So any, any study of Gaudiya Vaishnavism uh, uh, will naturally entail several um, several uh, uh, aspects or subfields for study. Uh, uh, actually, we should we should I should clarify that. So, Gaudiya Vaishnavism is a field of study, uh, but in order to study that subject, will require a variety of methods uh, to uh, study it. Uh, different approaches, methodological approaches. Okay. So that's that's what we're looking at is how do we study a field? Well, you do it through different methods, and each method uh, provides um, a, a, a different lens um, to to uh, um, uh, to help help us understand that tradition in from a variety of perspectives. So okay. I I would say. For so when a, you say lens, for example, say hmm. if you look at it from the his, would you, historical method, would mean that uh, how it, the reasons why it evolved and how it spread or why it did not spread at particular times, would that be one lens? Exactly, exactly. What are the different factors that went into its development uh, over time? Okay. What drove its development? What okay. evidence do we have? For the historical, um, the, the 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 various aspects of our tradition in its modern history, in its medieval history, in its ancient history. So, um, would Gaudiya Vaishnavism also have an ancient history, or you could say something like uh, the pre-Gaudiya Vaishnavism? Vaishnavism would be its history. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the historical approach is going to be um, probably the most um, significant uh, to begin with, unless uh, unless the listeners, the audience, the students have uh, a historical understanding of the tradition. There's not much use to going further into other methods. Um, now, are you seeing this from the perspective of an academic approach to study? Yes. Because in some ways, like inside the tradition, you can say we have a we have a somewhat a historical approach. Yes. That is when we study the acharyas, we study them more as uh, like ideal personalities rather than say people who are responding to particular factors by adopting particular strategies or choices. Yes. Yeah, and and even if you if you study it as great personalities who are acting uh, purely based on divine guidance, even then uh, that's historical um, in some sense, right? Not in an academic sense, but you're still mapping out the tradition from the perspective of the practitioner, uh, and okay. so. So um, we could say something like the Iniskan, the Prabhupada Lila Amrit could be one history of Iskan's uh, origin and growth. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Now, from an academic perspective, uh, these, um, you know, a historical study means that you're looking at the ways in which uh, different personalities are responding to the historical context uh, in which they are um working in which they are teaching in which they are writing and uh, uh that's that's what scholars mean 
by um, mm-hmm. h- history. And then they look for evidence, evidence for uh, their, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, they're looking for evidence for the historical veracity or the factual nature of different aspects of the, of the tradition. Okay. So, for example, some scholars will uh, uh, argue that, um, that, or suggest that the Shikshashtakam was not written originally as an Ashtakam, uh, that it was written as separate verses or spoken as separate verses by Mahaprabhu, which was later put together as an Ashtakam uh, after his time, that these verses were originally spoken by him and found their way into Padyavali. Mm. So, so yeah. you know, the, the, the scholars will look for evidence. Uh, is there evidence that the earliest layer of the tradition regards the Shikshatika <laughs> as a single Ashtaka, or does that emerge for the first time with Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami? Okay. So, for example, the Quran, it's well known that it originated as statements at different times, and later it was put together. Hmm. So, yeah, so now... So historical lens would be, say, uh, one lens. What other lens would we be using, say? Or do you want yeah. to elaborate on the historical lens first? Uh, the, the only thing I'll, I'll say is that, um, uh, it, you know, the, uh, the uh, understanding uh, historical context uh, can be both challenging to faith, but also very supportive of a devotee's faith. And so... It's not necessarily that the academic approach is is um, uh, uh, um, that, that that it uh, undermines a person's faith. It, it can, but it, it can challenge it. But it's not necessarily the case. You you see each one of the acharyas in and their their contribution in much greater clarity when you understand the historical context to which they're responding. So yeah, I think uh, maybe it's like you go from a little bit of a naive kind of faith to a more well-informed or mm, more reasoned faith. Not necessarily that it's just uh, we see them as great personalities, but also as great personalities who lived in the real world. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. yes, exactly. And so you know. Um, for example, Srila Prabhupada's uh, willingness to go to the West and and to uh, you know, give give diksha to any sincere person who wanted to practice be a Vaishnav, that is um, becomes much more glorious. We take it for granted today, but it becomes much more glorious when we recognize the context in which he was working. Um, at the time, it was unthinkable to have a non-Indian uh, person receive Brahman Diksha. It was already challenging to, to think of non-Brahman to receive Brahman Diksha. But Bhaktisiddhanta Sasti Thakura had made headway in that area. But uh, Srila Prabhupada really opened the floodgates to, to um, Americans and Europeans and Russians and Africans. So... Mm. We understand Prabhupada's um, shakti and his his, in other words, an understanding of Prabhupada's divine um, shakti and his an understanding of the historical context in this situation don't conflict. They they support one another, and his his uh, potency becomes more vibrant when we understand. The historical context. Uh, in other situations, Sometimes it may be historical. more challenging. Yeah, true. Sometimes the historical context may help us better appreciate the challenges inherent in certain choices that the Acharyas took. Yes. Mm. So, and then it can en- enhance our appreciation of them. Yes. Yes, from. So uh, besides um, the historical lens, uh, then there's also uh, um, a philosophical approach, philosophical method. Uh, and 
uh, philosophical can be divided into several sub areas. Um, the most important to start with is epistemology. Uh, what are the means of achieving valid knowledge? So in Sanskrit, we would call this pramana. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other is... Um, ontology? Ontology, yeah. Or metaphysics might be a little bit broader. Uh, so epistemology is pramana. Is there a word for metaphysics specifically in Sanskrit? Metaphysics or ontology. Uh, we can say tattva, the, what is actual reality. Okay. That's true. Praman. And then we have... um, Ethics would also be a part of it, I think. Yeah, ethics would also be part of it as well. Can ethics be called broadly dharma or is there some other word for it? I think dharma works the best. Okay. And then we can add a fourth one, although this, uh, you know, it's not often, it's not always included, but that's praxis or praxeology. Uh, and that's uh, what we might call uh, application or or, or vigyan or... Uh, sadhana. Sadhana. Okay. What about... Is aesthetics also becoming increasingly a part of philosophy now? Yes, 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 definitely. And that would be an important yeah. part of, say, Gaudiya studies. Yeah, especially. very important, very important part. So I was going to mention that it's aesthetics is crucial for us, especially. For every tradition, it's important. But for Gaudiya Vaishnavas, this is at the very heart. Uh, and that's, Would the word be Rasa? Yes, yes, Rasa Shastra. So this is not in any order of uh, importance, um, but oh, okay, all yeah. of these elements should be there. But I might think that it might be the order in which one would study also. You know, if this, we have to begin with epistemology, hmm. and then to some extent we move towards sattva, and maybe aesthetics is the final experience. It, yeah, that's the the fifth one is not the one I'm sure about because. I think it's important to begin with epistemology. Unless you can establish pramana and what is shastra and everything, then how there's nothing you can you can derive in these other areas. Okay. Then tattva is crucial um, also. So if you see Jiva Goswami Sandarbhas, he begins with uh, pramana in tattva sandarbha and shastra okay. and position of Bhagavatam, uh, sources of knowledge. And then he goes to Bhagavat and Paramatma Sandarbhas, which are speaking of... Um, metaphysics or tattva uh, mm. and uh, and then he goes from there to um to bhakti uh, sandar well krishna sandarbha which is also tattva um also metaphysics uh, to a large extent but it's bringing in some elements of aesthetics also uh, and then you have bhakti sandarbha which is definitely praxis and okay. Preeti Sandarbha, which is definitely um, aesthetics. Okay, so. this is nice. Hmm. So in one sense, ethics or dharma is not so explicitly emphasized in our tradition. Because almost to some extent, it's assumed that because the tradition emerged at a particular historical context, and dharma was to some extent assumed. Yes. That right? Yeah, this is a, a matter that um, uh, that uh, um, Joseph O'Connell addresses very nicely in his chapter in my book uh, called Chaitanya Vaishnava Philosophy. Uh, in that book, he has a chapter on ethics, Gaudiya Vaishnava ethics, and he raises this question as to why ethics is not spelled out as a separate area of philosophy in not just in Gaudiya Vaishnavism but across Indian religions. And I think the the reason is that it gets it really gets uh, rolled into um, well two things. One is that it it gets assumed uh, because all these traditions operate on the uh, on a on a basis on a groundwork of dharma that is there uh, the dharma shastras the expectations for varnashrama 
right? So mm-hmm. uh, even though Gaudiya Vaishnav texts don't spend a lot of time discussing Varnashrama, they're assuming that as kind of the, the, the norm in the societies in which they were written. Uh, okay. so, so part of uh, um, praxis is covered by um, by by uh, by dharma. Uh, it's assumed by dharma, uh, and then and then the higher levels of of ethics. So part of ethics is is assumed within dharma shastra. The higher levels of ethics are covered within praxis. So and he delineates this. O'Connell delineates this very nicely. When he describes, for example, you know, Dhanada Pi Suni Chena as this is an ethical principle for Vaishnavs of humility and tolerance and um, compassion towards other living beings. And these are all part of our praxis as Vaishnavas. So I guess, in other words, the field of ethics becomes dissipated it becomes split up between practice praxis and the uh, samanya dharma the, the kind of the foundational dharma that is assumed by any uh, religious author in pre-modern india mm-hmm. that's true in one sense i think some, some is Prabhupada also surprised when he came to america and certain basic things which people didn't know or people didn't follow so he was taken aback that you know this is almost common sense. Do I have to instruct you in this? Yes. So yeah, okay, that's a good point. So this would be say a philosophical lens. Yeah. So, uh, so historical and philosophical would be two major ones, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And then the next big one is going to be uh, sociological. Uh, sociology and anthropology are very closely related fields. And okay. um, uh, so sociology is going to entail um, understanding the way that Gaudiya Vaishnavism has uh, emerged and flourished as an institution, as a social institution. Uh, how has it interacted with a larger society? So, for example, how has Gaudiya Vaishnavism accepted or rejected, pushed back against the system of caste in India? Um, What are some ways in which um, it has uh, um, uh, created forms of hierarchy and authority within within the uh, Sampradaya. Okay, so basically, I'm just thinking the historical approach and the sociological approach, there'll be some overlap in it. Mm -hmm. But historical approach would be more about specific events and uh, a little bit more, like more movements, where this will be more like, uh, as you said, it's more of an institutional or a, would call society as an institution, something like that? Yeah, a Gaudiya Vaishnavism as a social institution. So uh, the, also the difference is, Prabhu, that this, this is sociological is much more focused on the contemporary world, like contemporary and, and modern. Uh, may, uh, of course, you can, you can look at the past also, but sociology's focus tends to be on how... how um, the the followers of a religion organize themselves. So you won't have something like uh, uh, the medieval sociology of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. You you can you can that that's possible, but uh, but the 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 strength of sociology is in is in contemporary uh, institutions. Okay, so so, so the, in terms of the historical about... sociology, Joseph O'Connell has written a whole book on this social institution, Gaudiya Vaishnavism as social institution. Oh, okay. So the sociology would mean, say, for sociology of Gaudiya Vaishnavism would probably study institutions like Gaudiya Mat or ISKCON or some other groups that might have formed who are followers of, or who claim to be followers of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Yes. Like that? Yes, exactly. 
Exactly, but also uh, looking at um, not just specific institutions, but also how Gaudiya Vaishnavas have organized themselves over uh, the centuries. Um, so uh, soft institutions versus hard institutions, for example. Yes, I have read that part, okay. So it's not yeah. so much which particular organizations are, say, propagating or following Gaudiya Vaishnavism, but rather how, how it's organized more. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, so so I, I, I think as a field, sociology is focused on the contemporary, but but I, I think historical is going to be important again to see the long stretch mm. of how Gaudiya Vaishnavas have organized themselves. So I don't yeah. want to suggest that it the past isn't important here. This is why we sta started with history. Because yeah, that's what I was thinking, that his without history, you said it's be difficult to study anything else. Yes. I mean, even the philosophy, right? Every philosophical figure that you'll study is going to be historical in nature. Uh, and you need to know what was the situation at the time that they were writing in order to appreciate their work. So Baladevidya Bhushana, you may study him philosophically. That may be your lens, your focus, your method. But still, you need to have some background about what was happening uh, in, in uh, Rajasthan at the time and what was the challenges that he was facing and uh, um, you know the, the the political ramifications of affiliating with one of the sampradayas. So uh, under under uh, Maharaja Jai Singh, so that is going to be important to better understand why is he writing a, go, uh, a Brahma Sutra commentary now, when our origin when our six Goswamis did not yeah. find a need for a Brahma Sutra commentary. Why is the commentary important at this point? So all of those questions are historical in nature. So anyone who wants to study philosophy has to understand some history, at least, in order to appreciate yeah, its like, significance. You know, suppose just to give, even today also, when an author writes a book, often they have a long introduction, which tells the story behind the story. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, why did, I, why did I write the book? And that helps us contextualize. Sometimes some other people write a foreword, yeah. or sometimes some other review, reviewer gives a context. And that also helps us understand the book. Yes. Yes. Better. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so in one sense, the we feel I just think we are studying Govinda Bhashya. Yeah. Its context is important. Yes. So, uh, if you consider the internal study of the move, study within the movement, yeah. say we have Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vaibhav. So, would there be a fourth category like a textual study, like literature or where would that fall? Yeah, so so um, uh, uh, let's go to that lens. Um, there's there's a whole uh, literary lens we can use, or poetic lens, to understand the literary contributions of the tradition, or or we can even say artistic contributions, and we might include um, fine poetry, uh, dance. Drama, music. Okay. Um, now, but I maybe are we going to different directions? Because uh, I don't know how much if as devotees, when we study Bhakti Shastri, we don't really go into any of these aspects. So would there be like a, the a philosophical and theological lens are somewhat different? Or are they a theology would in our tradition would theology would fall within tattva? Yeah, I, I mean, I think for for any Indic tradition, philosophy and theology overlap so much. That distinction between philosophy that and theology, the split that happened in the West, never happened in India. And so that that philosophical lens that we mentioned, we could just as well call it a theological lens. Uh, no, no problem. What what I'm describing now as another lens is uh, the. Uh, the artistic lens, or the okay. performative lens, we can say, or the literary lens. So that that's the next, that's the next method that we can use to study the tradition. So just to get to this quickly, uh, does this point philosophy? This philosophy theology split didn't happen in India so much, much because, in one sense, even philosophy was based on certain texts, whereas in the West, philosophy became more based on reasoning rather than on certain. 
certain tests tests that were considered authority or revealed yes uh, what we we might put it like this um in india uh, shabda or revelation was uh, which simply incorporated as one of the uh, pramanas even as reason and empirical knowledge uh, are pramanas there was no need to, it, it was just one more pramana that must be evaluated and incorporated into your study whereas in the west if we look at it from an indian perspective a shabda pramana or revelation was thrown out as the odd one out as the odd member of the family and uh, and rejected as the realm of theology theology is the one that uses faith and revelation belief etc whereas philosophy uses only anumana and pratyaksha but in india these were uh, scripture was just added to the list of pramanas was just not added but always included within that list there was no need to remove it so that's why philosophy and theology remain integrated mm. it's interesting when you say that even revelation was evaluated and sometimes we think that revelation is accepted as authority and it is but then what it means is if you consider the vedanta sutra commentaries they are the maybe the commentators won't themselves ever say that they are evaluating the sutras but in one sense they are putting them to logical scrutiny Yep. So in that sense, you could say, and that that if they are trying to give a rational explanation to this, exactly, and and uh, um, and the uh, uh, so 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 uh, for example, Jiva Goswami spends a lot of time evaluating the the strength of the Puranas and specifically of the Bhagavatam, right? And his conclusion, his argument, of course, is that. the the puranas are extremely reliable and bhagavatam being the most so but he goes through a pretty thorough process of evaluation in order to achieve that uh, okay. because the assumption is that someone could read it and and argue against it right they could question these the veracity the the strength mm-hmm. of the bhagavat as pramana so this is why he finds the need to do it so there's always evaluation of shabda pramana and and a close relationship with the other pramanas uh, we sometimes i think we separate out shabda in a very significant way that is uh, uh um i think uh, uh something of a misunderstanding of how shabda works when we when we separate it so far out that it becomes uh, in like uh, inaccessible to the other pur- pramanas when in fact it is in conversation with the other uh, pramanas um so uh, for example uh, jiva goswami says that um shabda praman is based on vaidusha pratyaksha uh it's based on the perception of those who are vaidusha who have actually uh, seen the truth who are wise tatva darshi it's based on their pramana uh, so sorry on their pratyaksha so pratyaksha is involved in in uh, shabda um in 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 uh, giving strength to shabda mm. uh similarly um uh you know krishna says in bhagavad gita that he is the supreme lord uh the cause of all causes that should be evaluated so so th- that should be accepted based on shabda praman that the bhagavad gita is revelation is shabda and krishna says you know matta parataram nanya there's no true superior to me so it should be accept- accepted uh krishna says i'm you know the whole universe is within me and he shows his universal form and that should be accepted now if someone comes like me and i say actually uh, i am the supreme truth and uh, i i can show you in my own sanskrit book that i am the supreme truth uh, then propa says in one purport uh, in 11th chapter he said immediately we should challenge them and ask them then show me your universal form right Mm. So what's happening here is that pratyaksha is being asked to evaluate and validate shabda and in this situation it t- it turns out that pratyaksha will show us that i am not actually the supreme lord you will discover that my supposed shabda uh, when evaluated falls apart uh, and and krishna shabda does not uh, this is why arjun says you know um he says uh, um 
uh, um, what is it? Uh, all these rishis in 10th chapter, Param Brahma. Thank you. So, Ahustvam Rishaya Sarvai, he says, see, your, your Shabda Praman is corroborated by Vaidusha Pratyaksha, by all these Vaidushas who have seen this. And now you are telling me, Swayam Jaiva Bravishime. Now you're telling me the same thing. So we could say one thing that the specific way in which Shabda is evaluated, that may or may not always seem rational or rationally persuasive to everyone. Um, that means ultimately the same book that is telling he is God is also saying that he is, uh, that, that, that book is only reporting that he showed the universal form. Hmm. So we could go into further discussion of how it is. But the point, point is well taken that there can be different ways of reasoning, but that there is a valuable role for reasoning and reasoning is present within scripture. Reasoning is present within the analysis of scripture. Reasoning is present within the, say, the explanation of scripture to people. So that's a good point. Sometimes the way we present it is that the you protection know, and Anuman are defective and therefore we need Shabda. Yeah. While that is true, but that does not mean that Pratyaksha Anumana are useless. Yeah, e e even, even Shabda has to be tested by Pratyaksha Anuman. Every Pramana has to be tested by the others. So, for example, uh, Prabhupada makes this clear in his commentary on Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4. He says there are, there are so many uh, editions of Bhagavad Gita written by the demons to create their own, to promote their own agenda, right? This he. It's in this uh, purport to... Um, yeah, 4, 434. Tadvindi yeah. Pranipatin. Or, I mean, ta, uh, before uh, that, also, 4 chapter. Uh, Bhakto Sime Sakha Chetin. That one also. 4, 3, 4, 4, 3, yeah. Yeah. So, 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 uh, who, who, so, 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 if you get an edition of Bhagavad Gita, right? It's Bhagavad Gita. Therefore, it is Shabda Praman. Therefore, you should, you should expect, you should accept it fully, wholeheartedly. Correct? Well, yeah, yes, but only after you've tested it. How are you going to test it? Oh, this author is bringing out his own agenda from it. How, how are we going to tell? Uh, the author himself will claim that he's, he's acting 100% accurately. His words are completely accurate. But Prabhupada is asking us that you look at it and see what Krishna is saying plainly, he says. right? He says plainly, Matta Paratanam Nanyat. There's, you should surrender to me. And if this commentator is saying you should surrender to, to the one within Krishna, then this is, this is trying to screw out some personal agenda from the Bhagavad Gita. Mm. So this requires one's use of intelligence, or at least the intelligence of others uh, that you trust. If we don't have that uh, capacity, uh, then we, we have to have some use, right? Uh, Prabhupada says blind faith, both... Uh, a blind faith and absurd uh, uh, um, question, absurd inquiry. Ex absurd inquiry are condemned. So blind faith means what? That we put we put uh, anumana on hold, we put pratyaksha on hold, uh, and we say, oh, okay, this is shabda. How do I know it's shabda? I don't know. Uh, it's shabda. It's my faith. So Prabhupada says that's condemned. So. Uh, there's no separation between them. Each pramana has to be tested and strengthened uh, by the others. That's it. Uh, now that you're presenting it, it is, it is, you can think of it how it's present everywhere in our very tradition, in our teachings. But another level is that it just seems as if, uh, it seems quite radical, a shabda can be evaluated. So in one sense, we are not actually we are not questioning the authority of Shabda itself. We are actually questioning whether a particular book that claims to be Shabda is actually Shabda or not. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, once we verify that it's Shabda, then it is not, it is unquestionable. Right? Then, then it is, uh, is Apaurusheya. It's, it's divine. So there's, there's no problem. But in order to validate it, I mean, the biggest weakness of Shabda is what? That we can be misled by claims of something being Shabda that is not Shabda. Uh, that, that's, that's the biggest weakness in that Pramana. I'm not speaking in that means of knowing. I'm not saying that, that this is a weakness in Gita or Bhagavatam. No. Mm. I'm saying that 
in that method of knowing, every method of knowing has its weakness. Just like uh, Anumana, when Krishna does Anuman, there's no weakness in Anuman. How can you say there's weakness? And yet we point out there's weakness in Anuman. If 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 uh, Krishna, if we're speaking of Krishna's pratyaksha or the sages, the rishis pratyaksha, there's no weakness. And yet we speak of weakness in pratyaksha. No, because these weaknesses are not in the in the ideal examples of that of that pramana. The weaknesses are are, are in our capacity to approach that pramana. Mm, so, uh, for example, our eyes presently cannot see spiritual realities. Exactly. So the, the, the process of seeing is not the problem. Our pres- present capacity to see is the problem. Exactly. So in the same way, Shabda is not a problem. There's no weakness in Shabda, but our capacity to recognize Shabda is a problem. And for that reason, we need Anuman and we need Pratyaksha. Mm. Good point. So that's why we can also have, I think, uh, hermeneutics as a field to understand what is actually Shabda. Yes. And even within a body of literature, what is Shabda and what may not exist. So Mamsa deals with that. Okay. This is fascinating. So Prabhu, is there any other lens that might be that you want to talk about? Uh, so I think you you didn't mark the uh, the um artistic lens uh, with your box. I, I don't think, I don't think we discussed that. Maybe we can we can discuss that now. Yeah. Briefly. Yes. We'll come back to this. So is this present in every tradition? May some traditions maybe it is more some traditions may in fact which are say which are more world rejecting may even consider art to be a form of maya or Satan's temptation or whatever. Yeah. Or, or even that approach would also be studied by the artistic lens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean to say uh, some may devalue it and some may claim that they don't have it, but every religious tradition has it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, there's no life without rasa. Uh, without raso uh, vaisaha, so without that, human beings cannot flourish. So we may devalue it and say this is not so important, or this is only on the vyavaharika level. It's not paramarthika. Uh, we can do that, but it's there from an academic perspective. It's there. Mm. Right from a theological perspective, it no, it's not there. In the ultimate Brahman, there's no art. Someone might claim. But from from a, 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 a his a academic perspective, you cannot uh, ignore it. So this includes everything from literary output, like poetic poetic output, um, dance, drama, music. You know, I was sorry. To, I think Garud Prabhu mentioned in the podcast that although Shankaracharya's uh, Shankaracharya ultimately says that everything in this world is Maya, but his language is quite quite grand, it's elegant, hmm. and that itself has its own charm. Yes, <laughs> mm. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So now, this would involve the artistic lens, would it be the same as the cultural lens, or would a culture include sociology? Or, let's like say, for example, we talk about Vedic culture. Yeah, and what exactly is Vedic culture can also be a big question, but uh, some of it would partially here, partially there. Yeah, cu- culture is such a um, undefined word, Prabhu. It's such a nebulous word that it it's almost useless when it comes to uh, trying to categorize things. Um, so much is part of culture. I mean, even the text that we were listing, right? The philosophical tradition is part of the culture uh, of. Uh, of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. The sociology definitely overlaps with culture. History talks about the development of culture. So culture is like this very general term. So it's but like, isn't cultural studies also a department? Yes, but they, they mean it in a very specific way that is um, um, okay. yeah, not very useful here. Okay. 
So in one sense, those aspects of culture which involve art would be included over here. Yeah. And say those are aspects of culture which are more directly interacting with society. Say that might go into sociology, something like that. Yeah, maybe a, a positive way to put it is culture is an is a concept that cuts across all of these uh, lenses. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So now, so, so if you go to artistic or aesthetic aspects, say for example, if somebody somebody studies Iskon, then we have the we have the Brahma Samhita sung at the time of Mangal Arti, not at Darshan Arti, Shungar Arti. So okay, how did that come about, or what it what it signifies, what its impact on participants, you know how it say contrasts with the uh, more traditional approaches to worship or traditional expressions of devotion would that all that come under artistic yes all of that would come under artistic how we decorate the deities uh, different styles of decoration of the deities um even one can discuss uh, uh, um you know creative expressions of cooking uh, can also be included uh, although there you that's not a typical example but uh, anything that is performative that has um creativity involved um so architecture is another wonderful one yeah i think your architecture exactly and drama mm. so even to some extent uh like dress might also come over here, especially elaborate ritual dresses or performative dresses, something like that. Yes, yes. Even yes. ceremonies like weddings and things would come over here in artistic, or at least for some aspect of it. So, so there's another big lens uh, that we need to cover, which I think the ceremonies will come better in that that one, uh, and that okay. is ritual. Oh, okay. Ritual would be the same as praxis in in our earlier definition, or. Uh, the praxis, the praxis in there under philosophy was more about the the theory of practice. So, for example, Vaidhi Bhakti and Raganuga Bhakti, and what is the devotee's ideal lifestyle like? By ritual, we mean things that are much more specific in terms of um, uh, the the. I mean, all these categories overlap. That's that's I think a very important point to make. Is that ritual yeah. connects so closely with sociology also, mm. and it connects very closely with philosophy and praxis also. So, it, this is not to suggest that these are uh, um, mutually exclusive, airtight categories. Uh, that would be ridiculous, mm. actually. Yeah, that's why ultimately this kind of study will have to be to some extent interdisciplinary. Right, have one one primary approach, but that approach to actually be coherent. We we'll have to draw from other approaches. Yes. yes. Mm. Okay. Yes, bro. So. Yeah. Uh, so so we can add ritual as one um, a method or lens. So, for example, this would include, if we consider our tradition, uh, scon specifically, it could include probably something like uh, the morning program and what all is included, how it is included, what it signifies. And maybe what are the varieties within that kind of, say, the deities are worshipped. So there are different ways of worshipping the deities. Yeah. Something like that. So, or, yeah, for us, the big category would be all of the Pancharatrika Vidhi. Uh, so mm -hmm. deity worship, Diksha, um, Samskaras, uh, all of these aspects would be uh, 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 very important to discuss under ritual. Mm. Now that you are speaking this, see, it's almost like, like you said, it's interdisciplinary. Many of these things get uh, get covered in Seshla Prabhupada's purports and our classes, but it's almost something which is which is known without being known that it is known. Mm. It's only when some outsider doesn't do it right, and hey, what are you doing? So it's a uh, oh, there is some something to be known over here. Uh, like, okay, you come to a temple and then you bow down to the Lord. That's something for a person who's a practice. That's just common sense. Yes. You don't even have to be told. But, but then if somebody not, doesn't do that, then what are you doing? Yeah. So, 
Okay. Yeah. It's fascinating. So it must be like very difficult for say even one person if you if you call somebody a scholar of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, it's that doesn't mean that they will have to specialize in one particular lens and one particular uh, one particular area. They to have a they might have an overview of everything, but still they can't really know everything about even one tradition. Yes, yes. Hmm. Not to mention then knowing other religious traditions and Gaudiya Vaishnavism's connection to those other religions. Uh, I mean, the, the, the sea of knowledge is really endless. Once you start mapping it, this is one of the benefits of doing a mapping like, like we're doing now, is that once you, rec- you do a mapping, you come to recognize Wow, uh, this there's so much, there's so much to know, uh, and uh, and I I barely scratched the surface, you know. Mm. This is you could say this is both enlivening and humbling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My my Sanskrit teacher, uh, Professor Narasimha Chari, uh, he used mm. to say. When uh, when a person first starts learning, then he thinks, uh, "I am I am the I am the only pandit, and I will you know defeat everyone else. Uh, watch watch my intellectual prowess." Then he becomes a, he actually learns a little bit more, and uh, he comes to recognize, "Okay, aham api pandita. I, I'm also a pundit. Uh, I, I, I recognize that there's others maybe who are who are uh, just as intelligent, maybe even more, but I'm also a pundit. And then the Thank true uh, person who has knowledge, yeah, the real wise person recognizes, aham na pandita. <laughs> what is that Kena Upanishad I think says now? That one who knows, one who does not know, Clay says he knows. Uh-huh. And one who... One who knows says that he doesn't know something like that. Yes. Mm. And uh, and Socrates said the same thing. You know, um, the oracle uh, at Delphi, at the temple of Delphi, the oracle mm. uh, said that uh, the wisest man. Someone asked the oracle. Uh, the oracle is the person who speaks for the deity. Yeah. So they asked uh, him. Asked the oracle. Asked her. Uh, who, um, who is the wisest man in Athens? And um, she said, Socrates. And they went back to Socrates and said, wow, you've been, you've been, the, the, the oracle has said, you're the wisest person. And Socrates was shocked. He was very confused. He said, I, I don't understand. And yet the oracle cannot be wrong. Means I have to respect the fact. So he was struggling with this question. And finally he came up with the answer. He said, now I know why the oracle is right. I am the wisest man in Athens because I am the only person who knows that he does not know. Uh, Everyone else thinks they know when they actually don't know. So this is what makes me wise. I know the limits of my knowledge. Mm. So same point, aham na pandita. To some extent, this can also actually decrease the forever in many conflicts because if you understand how vast the tradition is then the claim that I know certainly that I know with certainty this is the right way to do and that is the wrong way to do that claim will be undercut substantially and then that there will be a greater willingness to consider other people's perspectives and yeah there can be greater humility yeah, definitely. In a philosophical debate within the tradition, different sides arguing, I think one one very useful approach is to ask each side to honestly and thoroughly describe the weaknesses of their perspective, their view, their own viewpoint. Like, okay, it's it's the best possible explanation, but where's the weakness in it? Because that that or, or where's the weakness in your understanding of it? Maybe we it's difficult. We don't want to say there's a weakness in in the philosophy itself, but what is the weakness in your perspective, your view? Because b- both are based on the same pramana, right? I'm arguing from Bhagavatam Gita, you're arguing from Bhagavatam Gita. So 
The pramana is the same, uh, and neither one of us is going to say there's a defect in the pramana. So what is the weakness in your view, in your perspective, in your position? Because that requ- that requires uh, intellectual humility. And unless there's intellectual humility, no debate can be fruitful, no discussion can be fruitful. And this is just to emphasize the point that you just made, is that if we understand, if we take a position of intellectual humility, I know that I don't know, then then every discussion goes so much better. You know, so it's like, okay, TK, you've passionately argued for your perspective. Now, please explain the weakness in your viewpoint. And if a person cannot do that, then it's not worth discussing with them. It's not worth, they don't have the intellectual humility to recognize their own limitations. And we understand that humility is the first step. There's, there's no weakness in truth. But if we cannot accept the weakness in our ability to understand the truth, then what are we thinking? That we are we are God? Yeah, true. Actually, what you said earlier, the biggest uh, weakness with Shabda is to know what actually is Shabda. Yeah. So when I'm giving my understanding of Shabda, I may claim that this is Shabda, but if I have that uh, humility or capacity for self-criticism to evaluate how what I'm saying might not be Shabda, then, then there is a greater possibility for understanding. In some, one, time I, one way I put humility is that at least it's, it's the openness to the possibility that what I don't know may be more important than what I know. Yeah. Nice. Because for somebody to say, I don't know, that might be a bit too much. I know quite a bit. You know? <laughs> so, but at least that, I don't think any scholar can ever say that there is nothing that I don't know. Then, okay, then what I don't know, how important is it? Could it be more important than what I know? Well, maybe at least there's going to be a possibility for that. Um, very nice. I like that very much, Prabhu. Yeah. So, should I try? This is very nice discussion. Should I quickly try to summarize this? Yes, yes, Prabhu. Uh, so, we discussed basically uh, the idea of various lens or various approaches if you want to understand Gaudiya Vaishnavism, what are our various approaches to understanding it? And then we discuss, I think, started with the historical approach, yeah. which is looking at, in one sense, how events transpired, now, whether those events had divine causes or whether those div- events are respond in response, like intelligent or expert responses to historical context. Mm-hmm. Both about the histor- historical approaches in one sense, foundational to understanding a tradition, understand, and then after that, so the philosophical approach, which involves uh, various things, epistemology, and then ontology, praman, tattva, and then we have ethical ethics, dharma, tath, and then aesthetics, rasa. Then another important uh, approach was the sociological approach, where we study a tradition as a social institution, basically. How does the tradition organize itself? Uh, various kinds of organizations, organizational formats, and then how does it oh, how does it re- re- relate with other s- social f- organizations? How does it create a structure of hierarchy and authority within itself? Mm-hmm. Then there was one more was the artistic approach, and then last I think what we discussed was the ritual approach, and I think the last point we discussed was about intellectual humility, how no one can be expert in all approaches and no one can know everything about a tradition. So intellectual humility can also help us minimize conflicts. And one way to cultivate intellectual humility could be to just ask ourselves, what are the weaknesses of my position? Or what I don't know, how, how important might that be? Thank you, Prabhu. It's a very nice discussion. Hare Krishna. Yes, I enjoyed it very much also. (laughs) Thank you, Prabhu.